This is Five on Your Side at Five, focused on you. Tonight, we know the name of a five-year-old girl shot and killed in the Metro East, but police are still investigating how it happened. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Bush. And I'm Kelly Jackson. It was one of two deadly child shootings in the Bi-State on Monday, and it happened in a neighborhood off West Main Street in Belleville. Five on Your Side's Travis Cummings is live from the Belleville Police Station. What's the latest on this, Travis? Kelly Mike, earlier today, the St. Clair County Coroner Calvin Dye Sr. identified the child as Dariah A. Lathan. And yes, we're here at the police station, which is literally at the back of the home where this happened here. And I want to tell you the shooting happened Monday evening about 630. When police got there, they spotted a vehicle associated with the residents speeding eastbound on West Main Street. The vehicle was found to be transporting little Lathan to the hospital. Today we saw family members going in and out of the house where toys lay in the front yard right now. The family members didn't want to speak to us. Neighbors told us off camera how sorry they were for the loss and that it was refreshing to see a young person playing outside sometimes. My nephews are kids right now, so it's like the what goes through my head is like how, I don't know how they were shot, so I, I'm thinking like how how did they obtain the weapon like uh, like better weapon safety? Yeah, so many questions. There is still no evidence to know what led to the shooting at this time. Police are still investigating. We reached out to them earlier today, but have not heard back just yet. We do know they said yesterday that a gunman is not uh, in in the picture right now and that this uh, is no threat to the public at this time. We're live in the Metro East. Travis Cummings, five on your side. A man is charged in an accidental shooting that killed his seven year old grandson. That shooting happened yesterday morning in Berkeley. Police say Walter Macon left the boy Darnell Macon alone in his truck for about five minutes. The child found a loaded gun between the seats and accidentally shot himself. Macon is charged with endangering the welfare of a child and armed criminal action. Now to a live look downtown where we've seen a few clouds and some cooler weather today. Thank goodness. Let's check in with weather first. Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell, what can we expect for the rest of the night, Scott? Well, it looks like things are fairly quiet as we head through the evening hours. We've had a couple of spot little showers up to our north and northeast, but a comfortable afternoon and dry for most of us too. 84 degrees right now over in Forest Park. So is Mascuda. It's 86 in Troy, Illinois, 85 back in O'Fallon, 87 in Pacific. There's a look out into the Chesterfield Valley. Already starting to see the clouds on the downtrend here. And so skies should become mostly clear for a while. Most of what we've seen up to the north and northeast of St. Louis has been just isolated little showers and rumbles of thunder, and that's about it. And they're slipping away from us. So. We can say that it's safely quiet through the evening hours, comfortable too. Then we get into tomorrow. We have more storms on the way. It will be a weather first weather alert day because a few strong storms are possible. Better severe chances, including some gusty winds, will be south of St. Louis. Whether that makes it into the metro area remains to be seen. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes, Mike. All right, Scott. Tonight we know the name of the woman who was killed by a piece of debris that flew through her windshield. Jalen Rose was driving on Lindbergh and Florissant last week when another driver hit a road sign. Part of it went through Rose's windshield and killed her. Rose was 21 years old. The other driver was not hurt and stayed there to talk to police. President Biden's energy secretary visited St. Louis today to break ground on a new manufacturing site for electric car battery parts. Our political editor, Mark Maxwell, was there. What will this mean for the city, Mark? Mike and Kelly, more jobs, cleaner air, and cheaper electric vehicles. That's the big payoff promised at the first groundbreaking of its kind in the country today. The $400 million manufacturing plant expects to be up and running in 2025, cranking out essential ingredients for electric vehicles and their batteries. All of those lithium iron phosphate materials sourced here in the U.S., as opposed to China. The federal government covered the cost of nearly half of it, kicking in $197 million to an Israeli company that's partnering with a firm in Taiwan to build the supply chain at this manufacturing site in Carondelet. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, the former governor of Michigan, said it can be kind of tough for a state to lure a fish this big all on their own. When you're competing your state tax incentives with China, it's really hard, and especially when 
the labor rates in other countries are so low. But this is why what has happened now with this Invest in America agenda, it means that we have leveled the playing field. In fact, we have made the United States the irresistible nation to invest in. Granholm sold the clean energy plant as a solution to stop pollution, but she faced questions about the Department of Energy's pollution of another kind at Coldwater Creek and the surrounding areas with all that radioactive waste. Tonight at 6, more on her engagement with the victims impacted by the federal government's handling of those cancer-causing chemicals from the atomic bomb. All right, Mark. MODOT is holding public meetings so people can learn more about its plan to improve Interstate 70. It's a $2.8 billion project. It includes making I-70 at least three lanes from Wentzville to Blue Springs near Kansas City. Currently, MODOT is just in the planning stage. There will be two meetings in our area. There's one in Wentzville, August 28th at Wentzville City Hall. And there is one in Warrenton, August 29th at the Warren County Administration Building. Both are from four to 6 p.m. Researchers at Washington University have found high levels of bacteria and parasites in people living in Cahokia Heights. The issue links back to the Metro East City's failing sewage system. Five on your side's Tracy Hinson explains what the study revealed. Inside the walls of Washington University, work is being done that could change the way doctors treat patients out of Cahokia Heights and how legislatures see the infrastructure concerns there. We've been talking with doctors to tell them what we're finding so they're aware if patients come in with symptoms, maybe they should think about testing for H. pylori or, or other types of uh, intestinal infections. Infections doctors are thinking about when they ask you, have you traveled internationally? But if you haven't, they typically steer clear of those problems. In a small study last summer, researchers found signs of tapeworms and H. pylori in people living in Cahokia Heights. These infections lead to intestinal inflammation and can lead to bigger issues if left untreated. The research shows that Cahokia Heights numbers are high because of flooding and sewage issues there. My hope is that in the long term we can work towards bigger structural changes and improving infrastructure and really making sure people aren't exposed in the first place and they don't get sick at all. If you live in Cahokia Heights and are interested in participating in the study, you can stop by the library starting tomorrow between 9 and 3 p.m. to register. At Washington University, I'm Tracy Hinson, 5 on your side. Missouri opened its first safe haven baby box today in Melville. The baby box is a secure incubator that locks itself from the outside. Mothers in crisis can place their baby inside if they are unable to care for the child. After the babies are dropped off, they are picked up by first responders and taken to the nearest hospital. It can be found at Melville Fire Station number two off Telegraph Road. And the founder of the baby box chose that spot for a reason. When you take your, your story and you take your pain and you put those two together, you can make it into something amazing and that's what I've done. You know, I was abandoned as an infant back in 1973 and my birth mother didn't have any of these resources. We've had safe haven laws on the books for years. It's the, it's the anonymous portion of this program, I believe, that makes it so powerful. People don't want to be judged, they don't want to be shamed. Anyone can use the box, but the baby must be 30 days old or younger.